are live. Good morning, Rafino and Joe Show fans. I can't believe that I actually get to say that because normally, Joe, we are live at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time on Sundays, but due to Easter, we had to change some things up. And then, you know, tonight I won't be able to make it because LSU takes on Iowa. Angel Reese, Caitlin Clark, rematch. Who's your pick? Who do you think is going to win? Who do you think, do you think that I'm going <laughs> to Okay, I had to ask the stupid question. I'm obviously joking. I know that you're picking LSU to beat Iowa. Uh, I'm excited. I think that's going to be a really fun game. I know that women's college basketball is not everybody's cup of tea, um, but it is still a good 19 million people. Matchup. Well, you're going to have to tell the 19 million people who are watching games, you know, women's college basketball more than they're watching the NBA Finals. Yeah, the NBA Finals is so boring. So unbelievably It's bad boring. when LeBron's not in it. If you look at the numbers, every year that LeBron is not in there, the numbers, like, reduce by half. So, well, well, but the, I would argue, counter-argue, though, that I think that when LeBron plays, it's not as entertaining. I feel like it's the same storyline oh, every single year with LeBron. Hey. I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I could care less if LeBron wins – Another NBA championship. Okay. I'd rather see somebody else. That will it. be the ending of our <laughs> show this morning. Don't you ever talk negative about Are you King a LeBron James. fan? Are you oh, a LeBron fan? Not. You gotta oh. understand, Joe. You gotta understand because you're 10 years about 10 years younger than I am. When I was coming up in age, you gotta really uh -huh. me and LeBron, like LeBron's only two years younger than I am, right? So, like through the whole high school stage, okay. No, he's not. Wait, 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 he's like five years older than you. Uh uh, he's 39. Oh, so okay. so he's four years younger than I am. Older, you're not I mean, forty. Older than older than yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I was gonna say. I'm like, when I you was forty, yeah, this whole time? no, I'll be thirty five. <laughs> no, okay. yeah, I mean, we're not that far off. When okay. I was growing up, like junior high, when he was he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated, and then I'll never forget this. I got my first basketball game on like uh, PlayStation, and LeBron was just. I mean, I was beating everybody's ass, and this was an <laughs> online gaming was a big thing. Nevertheless, I think for me, he was just like my generation's Michael. You know, we're like my nephew. He, he's he's so big on Steph Curry, right? Because Steph was the guy uh, for him. So don't ever, and I mean ever. Yeah, talk I, don't, I can't. I mean, I can't. I can't stand LeBron. So I, this light is pissing me off. I, I should have. You're right. I should have put a blanket up. This is the this is the the fight that we're gonna have to deal with if we go at seven thirty. I mean, here before. here's the truth though. They're they're here to listen to your your boy. They're not exactly. Here to, you sure, know. sure. Nevertheless, we are probably gonna get into debate here this morning. I'm gonna try to be calm. Um, but we'll call that. Uh, okay, look at you. We'll talk well, about the top five OCs in in college football. By the way, on Google, I look I looked at this this morning. Rafino and Joe show from a college offensive coordinator content is number one on Google. Is it really? It's the first thing yeah. that shows up on, uh, on, on Google. Up, yeah. Rafino and Joe show. How about that? We will debate on that. I do think so. Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and make a disclaimer because I'm really good friends with one of these people. I mo lo lowered him lower because I didn't want to see be a homer, and then all of a sudden I see your top five, and I I saw that you went complete homer. Well, you can't you can't argue that I'm a homer because he hasn't done anything at my current school that I root for. And if anything, he's done more at your school that you have covered and rooted for. So I don't think that there's any homerism involved in my decision making. Okay. In all honesty, because clearly we're talking about Mike Denbrock here. Yeah, yeah. I think for Mike, and I think he would say that this is fair. If if I said this to him or what, I think he would say this is fair. He's got to do that at Notre Dame now, right? Like you can't have – Joe, as an offensive coordinator, the number one statistical thing that he's had as an offensive coordinator at every one, offensive line from a PFF statistical grading or not draft picks because he had a lot at Notre Dame. I'm not, in the, I'm not saying that. But wide receivers, quarterbacks, running backs – all at LSU were more productive than they were at his time at Notre Dame and at Cincinnati and other places that he's been. I do think Mike would tell you he's got to show that again at Notre Dame for him to be the number one echelon, number one OC in the country. And I think that he would think that that's fair. With that being said, 
if you have him outside of your top two, top three, you're an idiot. Okay, like I, I'm not. Uh, let's understand what we're debating here. That's the yeah. important part right there. It's the you got to put context into it. So we'll talk about our top five OCs. Why mm-hmm. you are down on Chip Kelly a little bit surprises me. I, I'm not down on him, and oh, I knew that that is in pre-production. No, 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 no. That 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 did not come out of my mouth. And I think that that is going to be the narrative that is going to be portrayed by Ohio State fans because I didn't put them at number one because they, for some reason, think that I hate them. That's not the case. We're going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to break it down and explain why he's not my number one. I'm surprised by your omission on a couple of guys. And I will say from Oregon, that's the big one for me i'm not going to get into it yet i'm wait till we get to that segment but i am very very surprised that you won't give him some more love it came down for me for one thing okay it was between him or garrett riley okay i and we'll get into this but it's a no-brainer no it no i can't do that because i think that Dabo has hindered him okay and i think when Dabo post tyler from from Stantonburg, okay, post that, Joe, you got to give him credit. Here's a, here's a very quick statistic for you. Joe, they went 75 yard uh, more yards per pass or per passing per game after that, 91 more yards on the ground after um, Garrett Riley was fully given over the play calling duties. So I, I think that – Look, he led TCU. He was part of the TCU run to the national title. I don't think he's worse. Here was the thing for me with Will Stein and Garrett Riley. When the going got tough, Garrett Riley, I think, has shown to be more consistent at times for me than Will Stein because the two biggest games he played last year, Washington clapped those cheeks. I I think that it's important to pay attention to the fact that Kenny Dillingham left – and the offense got better. That is what I'm going to bring up when we talk about this. Fair. I'll leave it at that. You'll we'll okay. have to wait to hear my whole argument. Not the only thing we'll talk about. Obviously, we'll got to talk Notre Dame because, you know, Joe. Um, but something that's interesting, um, Notre Dame AD making comments about the ACC. Not only that, they feel that they're in a strong position remaining an independent. I'm going to vehemently yeah. disagree with them on that, mainly due for one thing. It, 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 Joe, I only have one argument about Notre Dame remaining independent. That has to go with the the money that you can make in the playoff. See, I think what 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 we what we're missing here from a Notre Dame perspective, Joe, we're talking about one percent or less that they would make in the college football playoff when, not if they get there, when they get there in the twelve team playoff. Joe, you're talking about five to ten to sometimes in Ross Dellinger's piece, fifteen million dollars annually that you're missing on. That's not. That's. I mean, that's not chunk change here, Bucko. You know, like this is massive amounts of money that you're leaving on the table for what I believe is pride. One of the few times I'm going to agree with you on your thoughts on Notre Dame. Uh, Pete Bivacqua, who is the new athletic director taking over for Jack Swarbrick. I like him better for the future direction of Notre Dame. And I think that there's already been more of a financial commitment to the football program, especially because they were willing to spend the money on Mike Denbrock. But I did not agree with the statement that he had in this article that I sent you that I wanted to talk about. Going very under the radar. I know that it's a little bit of a not a nothing statement, but it's still an important piece of context that he is sharing that they feel confident in their independence and that they think that it it empowers them for the future of college football. I disagree. I think right now it helps that they're independent and that they can choose and that it allows them that they don't need to try and leave a conference and get out of a, a, a broadcasting media rights deal. But I do think, though, they need to pick a conference at some point. They need to, in the next 10 years, pick a conference that they decide they want to play in because things are going to dwindle down even further where they're going to be placed in a difficult spot. Notre Dame, I- I'm going to make an analogy right now, and you're going to hate it, but I think it will be cool. Notre Dame football or Notre Dame athletics right now 
is like a a girl who is a 10, okay, and is at a bar and can pick whatever they want to do, right? They can go home with any guy that they want to, okay? The problem is, is that they continue to fall on their sword for pride. And I, I think that it's going to wind up – what I think is going to happen is they're going to get to the playoff and realize that they make much less more money than everybody else – and then they're going to wind up having to go to a conference. Joe, I'm going to tell you something. Oregon lost a running backs coach. He's going to Ohio State. We'll talk about that as well. I, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not playing around on this one. I think that there's serious conversations about when April 15th happens. I don't know if – I think now that Ohio State's got a running backs coach, let's see what happens. I think that there are players that transferred in this past – portal window that we need to start keeping our eyes on what is going on with Quinshawn Juckins I continue to hear these rumors way too much I think that there's rumors rumbling around Ole Miss we'll talk about Ohio State getting a new running backs coach Joe I, I'm not guessing on this one I think that there's legitimate stuff going on with Quinshawn Juckins I don't know if I want to take that angle just yet because I feel Elks, like Quinchon very quickly. Elks in the comments. Elks, I'll put everything that I've ever reported on on this. Continue. I, look, look. The only, the only thing I'm going to say with Quinchon Judkins is he is so typically a, a he is so typically a guy over the past six months and that is continually until he enters the NFL a guy that there are going to be rumors about. There has been an unbelievable amount of just like scuttlebutt, just like complete, just whatever piece of information, conflicting pieces of information for a guy like this. So I think these narratives are going to get pushed, especially by certain crowds of fans that feel like they've been disenfranchised by his decision-making and his handling of his last opportunity when he was playing at Old Miss. I, I just until something happens, I don't really. He's one of those guys that I don't really want to buy. Very anymore. fair, very fair by you. I, I I agree. Let me just say this: the people at Ole Miss that are going to watch this show, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Joe, I'm just going to leave. I'm going to leave it at that. If okay. he stays, it would look. Let me. Let's say, if he stays, it, it it would not shock me. If that some bitch gets in the portal again, also would not shock me. <laughs> I mean, I hope for Ohio State's sake that that doesn't happen. I really hope that that doesn't happen. I do too. And you know what? This is the first thought when I had a phone when I had a phone call this weekend with someone. What is stopping a kid right now from going in the portal during the offseason, collecting their money from any collective in the country, and going back to the school that they were playing at? Well, that's what Caden Proctor just did. And I think that I, I really think that there could be another example this year where that does happen again. I don't think it's Quinchon Judkins, happen, but I think it's going to happen. Joe, we got 14 days. I guarantee you it's going to ha start happening in 14 days. Yeah. I don't disagree. Talk about that. All right. Joe, let's get rolling because we got a lot to discuss here. I see our good buddy Elks in the comments here. He says, but I'll bet you money in my wallet. So $5. <laughs> I'll take a five dollar bet, Joe. I'm just. This is one of those ones. I know that I joke and play sometimes on here. I'm not playing on this one. I'm not joking around. That I'm being dead serious about this. I, I had multiple people this weekend tell me the same exact thing, the same exact story, and I think at minimum, I think conversations are being had. Something that we need to monitor. Let's talk about our good friends over at BetOnline.ag. Guys, the final four is here. Men's basketball. Joe's favorite basketball player of all time and his favorite team, NC State, is in the final four. Also, you got big game tonight, LSU-Iowa. Go over there. Place your bets. BetOnline.ag. Use that promo code BELIEVE50 at checkout. That way that they know that Blake and Joe sent you on by. So about our good friends at BetOnline Top 5 OCs. We talk about that next. Stay with us. BetOnline Online is the fastest and easiest way for you to wager on all of your favorite sports, contests, events, with the first to market odds and lines. Find reviews for all the news for each league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, college sports, 
esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all of your sports information for live in game betting, props, and futures. Head on over to Bet Online today and use your mobile device to join and make your first sports bet. Use our promo code BELIEVE50, that's BELIEVE50, B L E A V 50, to receive your 50% off welcome bonus on your first deposit. That's betonline.ag, betonline.ag. We're back. All right. Joe, I got a hot take for you. Ready? All right, let's hear it. I think that I I'm hearing some things out of Texas regarding. I don't know if Quinn Ewers isn't in a battle with Arch. You're saying that there there can be okay. You dismissed the shit out of this when I I said that he should be given a chance to compete. I don't believe it. All right, I'm not going to respond to this. I'm not taking the bait. I made the comment a while ago that he should at least be given a shot to compete. I don't want to hear it. But by the way, Devin Brown, we will talk about Devin Brown on Wednesday. We will talk about Devin Brown. I, I Let me say this too. I don't think that he's necessarily competing. What I think is happening is, Joe, they're trying to get him ready as quickly as possible because they feel that since Quinn has been hurt the last two years that he's got to be yeah. ready at any yeah. given moment. All right. Yeah. Let's get to this. Joe, there are a lot of play callers that aren't OCs. You got Lane Kiff and Steve Sarkeesian that are out there that arguably Joe should be on this list. But today we'll talk about our top five OCs. I'm going to give you the floor here. We have some graphics, some lovely, lovely graphics here. We'll start off with your top five OCs in the country. Uh, Read them off your list. Who are your top five OCs? Yeah, number one, as we alluded to in the open, Mike Denbrock from Notre Dame and also formerly of LSU, coached up the Heisman Trophy winning quarterback, Jaden Daniels. Number two, Chip Kelly from Ohio State, recently hired over from UCLA, who was formerly their head coach. Number three, Will Stein from Oregon. Ooh. Number four, number uh, sorry, number four, Andy Kotelnecki <laughs> from Penn State. And then what lastly, name. number five, uh, Alex Atkins from Florida State. All right, Let, let's get – can we get Mike Denbrock out of the way? By the way, I have Mike Denbrock on mine for, at three. Joe, I think that Mike Denbrock, without a shadow of a doubt, needs to be in the top three. I don't think that there's a debate. I don't think that there's a question. Here is – and it, it's different because when I talk about anything Notre Dame related or if I talk anything about something that happened with LSU that goes elsewhere – People always use the the three little words, you are biased. Mike Denbrock, arguably to me, is probably one of, if not the, you can make the debate for the best offensive coordinator at LSU maybe ever. I think Joe Brady, Steve Insminger are above him there. Here's the, here's the thing that I, I say with Mike, and I think that he would believe and tell you that this is fair, just knowing him the way that I do. Joe, he's going to have to produce at Notre Dame for me to put him at one because I I do think that there's something to be said when you come to a school in the SEC with arguably two top 15 wide receiver or two picks at at wide receiver with Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr. He's not going to have or top 20, whatever you want to call him. I, I don't really care. He's not going to have the weaponry at Notre Dame. I do think that Mike benefited a lot from having Jaden Daniels, Malik Neighbors, and Brian Thomas Jr. There were times, okay, that people question his play calling, but I think that Jaden Daniels bailed them out of a lot of bad situations. He's not going to have that right now. That does not stop for me that I think Mike Denbrock, figure out your order. I don't really care. If he's not in the top three, then you're an idiot. But for me, I need to see Mike go to somewhere else and be able to put up a lot of the same offensive stats that he did. Joe, I will remind you, when he was Uh at Cincinnati, okay, even though play calling was, I thought he was exceptional, okay? He was exceptional at Cincinnati, which then led them, got Desmond Ritter there. That is, I I will always back that. The problem is, Joe, I don't know if sometimes some things that he does offensive play calling wise leads them to getting over that hump. I do think 
that you got to see him post LSU without all that talent to say. Because, Joe, if they take a step back or if he takes a step back and Notre Dame's offense is still sluggish at times, what's our thoughts going to be on Mike Denbrock? Well, okay, anytime a new offensive coordinator takes over, it's not going to be immediately hitting the ground running in week one. It's just – it's not going to happen. The first three to five weeks are probably going to be a feeling out period, especially for the fact that Riley Leonard – is currently de dealing with a foot ankle injury that he is recovering from. It's lingering from the injury that he suffered against Notre Dame when he was at Duke this past season. So I think if it's a little bit slow to get going, that to me doesn't diminish my thought and outlook on him. But you're bringing up how you want to see him succeed at another school. We've seen him succeed at, an, uh, at another school. When Cincinnati was a G5 program, they reached the college football playoff. His play calling and his offensive impact was so great, it was so strong, that we were convinced, and the Atlanta Falcons were convinced, that Desmond Ritter, who sucks, is unbelievably terrible, was one of the worst starting quarterbacks that I've seen in the past five years. He made him look like a competent draft prospect. He turned guys like, um, oh my God, I'm playing on the Ford, I forget his first name, uh, Jerome Ford. He made him a very productive college back. I just think that for what he was able to do at Cincinnati with way, way less than what he's starting off here with at Notre Dame, I think that that's proof to me that in any circumstance, he can step in, he can evolve with the roster, and he can turn them into a productive piece of the team that they are an advancement and that they're not a hindrance despite there being a lack of talent. I just think that he comes into Notre Dame and he was – as highly sought out as, as he was because of his impact at Cincinnati and then him coming to LSU and turning into guys that were good players, but helping them emerge into elite ones. Because I, I would argue... Well, I, I vehemently disagree with you on there that. There are plenty of times, and I and look, Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr. were highly recruited kids, but N Notre Dame recruits four-star receivers that didn't pan out. There are plenty of teams in the country that recruit four-star receivers that absolutely do not pan out. So he but, was able to unlock LSU that. That's is, important. But LSU has not been one of those places. Joe, like we're, what, we're, what forgetting, we're forgetting that LSU has a track record of elite dudes at wide receiver. Like, don't, don't misunderstand. Yes. Don't I, I, misunderstand. I know, I know. Okay. But it's not a guarantee that just because you recruit a kid who's a four-star that he's going to be good. Because I'm pointing at the fact so that Notre Dame has had those into, kids and they sucked. He also came into LSU with those dudes. All right, like, don't, don't misunderstand. Malik Neighbors, Joe, this time last year we did our breakout players. I yeah. had Malik. Malik was always going to be that dude. So was Brian Thomas. Yeah, but My, Malik Neighbors, it wasn't Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas, weren't they there the year before, before Denbrock got there? Am I wrong? Because Denbrock was only there for two seasons. Yeah, they were there. So he did not bring them in. Yeah, I know. My but he, is, I do think that that has a lot to do with Cortez. And, J Joe, you can't talk – that's like that's like Notre Dame at offensive line. Sometimes it doesn't matter who the O-line coach is. When you okay. are prestige there, okay, you are prestige there. My thing with Mike is when you want to talk about Cincinnati, Joe, the reason they beat Notre Dame that year and got to the playoff was what they were doing on defense. Let's not mistake that. Their they offense was still very, very productive. Okay. Most so of the players they, that got they, drafted were offensive they were players. They were 97th in the country in offensive production. Because the their roster it was talentless. It, it, okay. Sounds good. I need to see him post-LSU put up those – if you're going to put him at one above Chip Kelly, if you're oh. going to put him at one, then you better be able to go wherever the fuck you need to go to to bring me that. How many offensive – or uh, not offensive – how many Heisman Trophy winners has Chip Kelly coached? Three. Two. Who? Oh. oh, and Mariota. I'm a dumbass. Mariota that was a dumb take. Then, yeah, that's um, a dumb take. God dog it. Why am I forgetting? No, it's just it's just Mariota. No, you said coached. You you didn't say where he coached him at. I mean, he had uh, he, was, he was, was at Oregon, and before that, he was at New Hampshire. So I don't think that there was there was so no Mar UCLA Mariota. guys. Yeah, Mariota would be so the he's, one. So he's coached. Look, and to to pivot this into Chip Kelly. Chip Kelly is the number two for me. Oh, okay, can I, can I give mine so that we go can ahead. Show the Go here? ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Just very quickly. 
Here's my top five OCs, Chip Kelly, Kirby Moore at Mizzou at number two, Mike Denbrock, Colin Klein at Texas A&M, and Garrett Riley at Clemson at five. But continue, let's transition in here to, to Chip Kelly. Okay, so this is going to be perceived as me knocking Chip Kelly. I am not knocking Chip Kelly. I'm not saying that he is not going to be one of the most productive offensive coordinators in college football this upcoming season. Ohio State is going to be unbelievable. They're going to put up a ton of points. The only thing that I'm saying is that it has been since 2008 since he has been a sole offensive coordinator. I just don't want to immediately put my eggs in that basket when he has been a head coach. And I understand that he has been the play caller. He has been the offensive decision maker, all of those things. But he's being placed in a different setting where Ryan Day has typically been the offensive mind that has been the one who has shaped things offensively for Ohio State. All I am saying is that before I'm willing to commit to him being number one, just like you're saying here with Denbrock, I'd like to see the results first. But we've seen Chip go to different places, even in the NFL, and it offensively that they've exploded. Their offense was god-awful last year because he couldn't make up his mind at quarterback, and he had Dante Moore running like okay, option that, plays. That's fine. I will give him a year. I don't think that we can look at just one year and say that you're bad because if you do that, then, oh, I mean, you're going to just take the one year of Mike Denbrock. You can't do that. You have to sometimes But I'm not. At, I pulled up the whole I pulled up the whole okay, well, scope you're gonna of use, his career. You're going to use, okay, complete like just career long things here which i think that mo both of us did here joe chip kelly not having or not being the head coach makes him more dangerous i don't disagree with that notion because yes it takes a lot of other things off of his plate and he can just Correct. focus on offense which is why i'm optimistic that this works out why i said that it was a fantastic decision to persuade him to come and join this coaching staff but again, he hasn't been an offensive coordinator just solely since 2008. And I just want to add, he is a very boomer bust offensive decision maker because he's either one of the best or at times, just like last year, one of the worst. I remember back when he was the head coach with the San Francisco 49ers. They were god awful that year. They were terrible that season. He is not a steady, consistent hand. It's not, it's not often that he's bad. But it's yeah, happened. But, but Joe, there's a difference here. There's a difference in reference to you can say that that he is the ultimate decision maker when it comes to being a head coach. The truth is, is that Ryan Day is the head coach. Okay. You're talking about him purely as just the OC, where Ryan Day can override him, right? Like Ryan Day, at the end of the day, that's him. When it wait, comes but I don't know if I but I wait, I don't know if I want that though. Like with, with a guy like Chip Kelly, he's a well, very unique individual. Ways. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't say that Ryan Day it will Chip Kelly, you know, sometimes he's boom or bust, and then say that Ryan Day isn't the ultimate decision maker when it comes to things. Wait, but that's part of my argument though, is that he's he hasn't worked for somebody since 2008. That's why I'm bringing this up. I don't know how he's going to handle this dynamic, is why I'm bringing it up. He, it's more important than people realize. Sure. I, I I will agree that that Chip Kelly can be an asshole. I also think that, that Ryan, wasn't what I said. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> Sorry, okay. that's but not it's, what I was getting at. <laughs> no, it's one thousand percent is what you're trying to hint at. That he hasn't worked for anybody, that there can be Joe, you you just brought up that there That's can not, be. But I didn't say I, I was not implying that Chip Kelly's an asshole. All I was saying that he it has been almost twenty years since he has worked under someone. That is a weird and dynamic Joe, 20, to get used to. And twenty years ago, Bill Belichick was winning Super Bowls with Tom Brady. I don't think that anything changes from X's and O's for him knowing offense. Joe, here's the truth: he completely revamped offensive play calling, not just in college football in the NFL. Yeah. He is the reason that, that things changed. He has better athletes. That, that is why this is going to work. Joe, here's the truth. They can call boot right or, or, or buck pull right or buck pull 36, buck pull 38. Okay, and he can have success with the running backs that he's going to have, the wide receivers that he's going to have. I do think that there's a lot of things too, Joe, last year and times at UCLA. It's not necessarily play calling as it is execution. 
I remember him winning in – Joe, he had nine wins at UCLA. With who? So my, my point is, okay, I think that things have to be scalable on what he is, who he is, and what he's done. The game has changed for him. And he goes, look, man, I just can't – to him, this is just me saying, I can't compete with the way that NIL is. I just want to call plays, coach football, and get out of there. Joe, quite honestly – He's going – they're arguably going to be one of the top five offenses in the country, mainly due to the fact of what he does. I mean, like, Chip Kelly is one of, if not the best play caller in, in the country. I, I don't disagree with that. Okay, so let me – I need to add this qualifier before – I'm sure that there's going to be a litany of, of comments from Ohio State fans getting mad at me because same thing happened with Will Howard when I, when I said that I wanted to wait and see before I was willing to commit to this thing being as great as they're projecting all i will say is i would not be surprised that if at the end of the season we reevaluated this list and i was willing to move them up to number one i'm not this is one of the few instances where i'm not saying no this is going to how it how it's going to finish i think chip kelly absolutely can finish at number one i just would like to see him as an offensive coordinator for the first time since 2008 and know that it is going to work as swimmingly as it will as it will i'm not saying he's number 10 I'm not saying he's just like you're saying with Denbrock. I'd be a dumbass if I didn't put him in my top two at the bare minimum. <laughs> I just don't think it's a foregone conclusion that he's number one. No, I think you wanted to show your Notre Dame people that you you love Notre Dame. And, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to leave Alex Atkins alone on yours because Florida State fans hate me already. <laughs> um, so I'm going to leave that alone. I do think that Alex Atkins is a really good play caller. I think only thing that I'll say for me is – Joe, when your court when when Travis went down offensively, they were just so anemic. You still got to be like if you're still a really good play caller, you can you can move the ball a little bit with a quarterback. That's a okay. that's a that's a fair point. All right, so I, I look, I like Alex Atkins. Still think he's a top ten OC for me. I just because of what happened and how bad it was at the end of the year, Joe. We were proven that they won games off defensively. And I think that he gets a lot of credit because that team and that defense continuously generates turnovers, and they're going to be really good defensively again. I, it, with all due respect, defensively, Florida State's in the top five every year, whoever the D.C. is, because of who and what they're going to provide. I just can't have Alex Atkins there. I'd put him six, seven, eight. Doesn't really matter to me. I, I got to get to one for from you here that I got to debate mm -hmm. with you. Will Stein. All right. You have Will Stein at number three. I don't actually hate that, really. For me, though, I just think play calling was so bad in two big games versus Washington that I just have my doubts. Like, I, I, I have my doubts in reference to when you're playing two big games, and by the way, Will Stein's OC at Oregon. When you're playing in the two biggest games, I know that they put up yards, offensive production, things like that. But, Joe, I, I remember that first Washington game when they went for it multiple times on fourth down, and we were blaming Dan Lanning. Remember, like, they should have kicked field goals. They could have won that game in Seattle. And the offensive play calling that they had when they went for it on multiple times on fourth down was abysmal. Abysmal. You got fourth and one, and you're trying to roll Bo Nix out right. You're having chaotic play calls. I think the inexperience that Will Stein – had in that big moment wind up backfiring for him. This is all that continues to stay in my head. You, on the most crucial plays that you ran all last year, most of them came down to what you were doing offensively and offensive production. I get that you were a top five offense. That Fine. You played some really shitty teams, okay? The bottom line for me is when – Joe, they played – Joe, wait, 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 wait. So, so you can't the top, they didn't face a top 15 defense all you year. You can't put you can't put Garrett Riley on here who at Clemson in the the he had a half of season of, of offensive success. Not a full but season, problem, a half of season of offensive success Riley, against shit opponents. The problem about Garrett Riley is they had five straight games where they faced top 15 defenses. So there's a massive difference when you are facing elite defenses, elite teams, versus when you are playing Washington, who, by the way, Joe, is not a good defensive team. We Now we okay. know this. 
okay. in the most critical times and critical situations, the play calling for me was not good enough. I completely disagree. I think that Will Stein, for them to go from Kenny Dillingham, who was regarded as one of the, one of the best offensive minds in college football, leaves for Arizona State, and the offense gets better. Bo Nix is even more cerebral and quick decision-making than he was the season before. Bo Nix hit his stride as an elite of a college football player as he had been in his entire career. It was the best season that he had played. I think that it is worth recognizing in importance. What? Check down Bo Nix. Look, we can make fun of the offense and how simple it was because it was a lot of really just quick reads, get the ball in the hands of your playmakers, but it still produced one of the most productive running backs in the country, one of the most productive quarterbacks in the country, and one of the most productive receivers in the country. They were explosively offensively potent. And I understand that they might not have played any top 15 defenses, but they still faced difficult competition throughout the entire stretch of the year. Not all the Pac-12 opponents that they name saw the, were weak the best and soft. That they faced. Uh, Oregon State. Oregon State was known for the quality of their defense. And they that, put up pretty, pretty good real? points on them. Yeah, they did. That's fine. Again, I think it's laughable when you're talking about, like, if Oregon State is the best defense that you faced, right? Joe, it, it, to me, I think that there's got to be a level of who your opponents were and when you faced a, a top-tier opponent. J Joe, do you really agree with what they did against Washington both times in critical downs and critical situations? Like, that, that in and of itself, the play calling that he had there at the end should legitimately make you look at him and say, is he ready for me to put him at three? Like, I, I, don't, yes. think we'll, I don't think that we'll – no, there's no way. Because if any – let me tell you this. If Chip Kelly, okay, were put in the same situation, if Denbrock were put in the same situation and they failed, we would look at them at much more of a negative light than we're looking at Will Stein right now. Okay, so you bring this up and how I have him at three, and then his, you know, his in-game decision making, you know, in certain spots was questionable and should cause for concern. But you have Kirby Moore at number two. Yeah, that's what's 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 bothering me is that you were willing to commit to Kirby Moore and to Garrett Riley, who had inconsistencies as well. Where I, I think there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn between Will Stein and Kirby Moore with Missouri and Oregon, where maybe not the most physically gifted quarterbacks were able to be productive. And then you have really dynamic receivers that were some of the best in the country this past year, really good running backs, but in their biggest games against the best opponents, they floundered at times. And their no, they, defense yeah. was the reason why. Yes, they did. Their defense was the reason why they were able to, to keep okay. things close with Georgia and the reason why they were able to beat the shit out of Tennessee. No, George, they couldn't stop Georgia to save their life. It was Blake Baker's worst called game. Trust me. I <laughs> believe me. Can I let me defend Kirby Moore for a minute? Okay. Joe, you have come on this platform and this show and completely took massive amounts of dumps on Brady Cook. No, 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 no. No. In week two, going into the Kansas State game, I said that he wasn't very good. You and then I stuck. took those words back. I took okay. those words. Missouri fans booed him. They booed him going into that game. I don't care what they did. Okay, but so here's, look. here's the truth. Go ahead. He took a Division three running back and made him the leading SEC back in the country with guys like Quinshawn Juckins and others. By the way, Luther Burden is fantastic. Joe, name an offensive lineman that was a four-star. Name someone else besides Luther Burden that was a four-star. The, the thing that separates Kirby Moore is, is that they are building into something. I think it takes longer. Oregon has already established itself. Missouri has not established itself and been able to get the top-tier recruits in there that they need to to compete with the LSUs, the Georgias, the Alabamas, et cetera. But what are they doing, and what is Kirby Moore doing? Joe, you cannot deny that Kirby Moore is developing better as an offensive coordinator than anybody in the country. The simple fact that you can take a D3 running back and Brady Cook, Joe, and get them get you to 10 wins is immense. By the way, they got to 11 wins, and everybody says, oh, so many people opted out against Ohio or for Ohio State. That's cute. 
Name me people that opted out for Missouri. My point, my point in that would be saying well, they have a lot of underclassmen, so it's not like they true, but they still had dudes on defense that opted out. So don't don't come at me and say that Kirby Moore has taken lesser talent. By the way, by the way, he is a he is a touchdown away from beating the Heisman Trophy winner. He and it wasn't on him. Those losses that they had, LSU, Georgia. Joe, when you're putting up 30 or close to 30-plus points, your defense has to be able to hold on. Okay, but... He would... They're, they're uh, they... 39 points against what was... If the offense was as good as you're painting it, they would have beaten LSU. LSU's defense was... They couldn't make a horrendous stop. last year. They could not make a stop. The, the, the problem with that was... Joe, if, when you can't make – if you score 39 points, Joe, you should win. Bottom line, I don't want to hear anything else that if you score 39 points, you should win. I, I don't I, I don't think that that is well, – wait. I believe Oregon put up some really big points in those losses that they had to, to Washington, did they not? In, is there, there's a difference in facing Georgia, LSU – and Tennessee Washington and went to the national championship game. We can't like just just because you didn't think Washington was so very good doesn't mean that we can just dismiss that. Schedule. So we're talking about a season long schedule. And by the way, they played Washington. Washington defensively was ass. They were ass, and you so know was LA, they scored. They Washington's defense was better than LSU's defense, and Wash Oregon put up thirty three and thirty one the two times they played against them. And they, I, I just wait, wait. I brought up, you, I brought up, I, I brought up Kirby Moore the, in the context of talking about Will Stein because it's important because you're talking about how well in some of these big games in these big spots they didn't do so well. I, I don't think that it's like a, a foregone conclusion that that Kirby Moore had this perfectly unscathed season. No, I, I think that there were Kirby slip ups multiple times. You know what Kirby Moore did have when they needed what? to go get a touchdown against Georgia to to get it within a three point game, they got it. When they needed a touchdown to take the lead against LSU, they got it. By the way, they won every other game. My point is, is when the, when it came nut cutting time, they scored touchdowns. They weren't giving things up. Now, Brady Cook threw a pick six at the end of the game, and it is what it is. But he hooved it down there because he had to. He didn't have a choice. My only point is, is that Kirby Moore has taken less. He's made, he's he's made chicken shit and, took it, and made it into chicken salad. You know and I know that Oregon has better personnel than Missouri does. You know yeah, that. they do. They obviously do. I... I also think that we're you're we're, we're also not even bringing up the fact that Oregon led most statistical categories for just general offensive production and also if, had one of the best EPAs per play, which is an important metric for evaluating offensive success. Meanwhile, Missouri was I think somewhere in the in the mid thirties. There's a pretty yeah, huge no, gap. They were twenty. They were twenty eight in EPA. I'm seeing 36 on this website, but EPA I think is one of the most important, one of the most important stats for me to understanding offensive success oh, because sorry, it is a de- in total offense. I'm sorry. EPA is a depiction of how teams perform above expected. So basically, how how explosive is their offense? How many, how quickly can they put points on the board more than they're expected to in most situations? And Oregon checks that box. EPA is what runs college football. Can I, can I end this argument for you very quickly? Okay. If you were a head coach and you were trying to get to a playoff or a national t- championship, what what team, what schedule would you rather, Oregon's or Missouri's? I'd rather uh, – uh, actually, Go I don't know. Wait, wait, wait. I don't, I don't think – they're pretty even right now because now that they're playing in the Big Ten. You're talking about last year's schedule? Yeah, last year's schedule. Because Oregon's, this is obviously they, Oregon's. Oh, okay. So again, when they needed, when again, what I'm saying is when I put so much value on when the game is on the line, what do you dial up? I saw Will Stein fall, okay, where I saw Missouri and Kirby Moore rise to the occasion and score to get them back in the game. It's not their fault that their defense sucked. By the way, Oregon has better personnel defensively than Mizzou does. So they should be able to make those stops. Okay. Whoa, no, 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 no. Missouri is about to have, 
about to. I can. Oh, wait, 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 wait. They're, they're going to have five guys draft in the top one, four to five guys drafted in the top 100 picks. Which, which, again, we should talk about what Eli Drinkwitz is doing in developing and recruiting. Their, their blue chip rate is more close. Let me tell you this. Missouri's blue chip rate is closer to Vandy than it is Alabama's. Okay, I understand that, but, uh, but this also kind of ties into why I still don't like the Kirby Moore being ranked as highly as you had him because their team was far more balanced and strong defensively than Oregon's was. Oregon's defense was really good. It was very strong this past year, but there was a big gap of separation between the two in terms of if they went against one another, I would argue Missouri would probably win because their defense is better. Would have won. Sorry. Would have won. Well, of course, because they have better personnel. My point is, okay, regardless of who wins the game, he is still developing offensive pieces, Joe, that is going from D3 to the leading rusher in the SEC. I, I just don't get why you don't like Will Stein. I, don't, I, I, don't, I didn't say I didn't like him. I, I've said twice now that he would be in my top 10. But because I have the vivid memory, by the way, <laughs> Oregon fans are going to be mad at me because I picked them twice and they lost. Thanks, Will. Okay. <laughs> I, I, oh, me, so that's why you're salty. Oh, no, I knew that's what you were going to say. For me, just personally, when it comes down to when it when the game is on the line, I've personally seen – Kirby Moore offensively dial things up to get them back in the game or take a lead versus when I saw Oregon literally last year when it came down to nut cucking time for you to make it to the playoffs, Will Stein did not live up to the expectations. That's all. And, and you know what? Can I, I, I'll end it with this. You came to me and you said something that I thought was so profound about Kalen DeBoer. You said, Blake, Oregon, from a, a prospect standpoint, is better than Washington was. And we put Kalen DeBoer on a status because he's taken low recruited dudes and mm -hmm. was able to elevate them very high. It's exactly what I'm doing for Kirby Moore. 1,000% what I'm doing for Kirby Moore. All right. I'm looking up Troy Franklin and how high of a recruit he was. How high of a recruit was Troy Franklin? Oh, he was a high four star. He yeah. was the fifty fourth, and then let's player in the country. Burden. No, yeah, you he can't was. Do burden because it it. Well, it, those were the both the the way, those were the two top receivers on both teams. Sure, but you would he have was to a five go star. All, he was the number two the receiver in the country. All, Joe, who was their running back? You'd have to go all the way. You'd have to go every position group. Bucky Irving was a was like a low three star from Minnesota that they added. Like Minnesota. He was, <laughs> he was, he, oh, so he was a four star. I'm I'm misspeaking. Okay, a D three no star rated running back versus a high four star. All right. Do um, we have anything else before we get out of here? No. Let's uh let's do the Ohio State running back topic, and then I obviously got to be off at eleven. But let's I want to get to this running back topic and hit on that. You don't want to get to Coach. Notre Dame very quickly. Let's let's save that for Wednesday because I think that's a longer discussion. Okay. Should we do an ad break? Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Let's talk about our good friends over at Home Field Apparel. We're back next. Rafino and Joe Show is brought to you by Home Field Apparel, which is the best, without a doubt, premium collegiate apparel brand that is out there. They have over 150 different colleges that you can choose from, whether you're an Illinois fan or a Rutgers fan, maybe you're an LSU fan like Blake, or maybe you're an Alabama fan, whatever it is, even Idaho. They have so many different designs for so many different football programs that I can guarantee you're going to find some great stuff to help root for your favorite team. I've already gotten my Notre Dame stuff. Blake has his LSU stuff. Make sure you head on over to homefieldapparel.com to check out your team's collection of clothing apparel that they have on the website. And when you do so, when you check out, make sure you use promo code Rafino Joe to get 15% off your order. That is R U F F I N O Rafino Joe. Head on over to homefieldapparel.com and get your college gear today. Since my Jaden Daniels versus Caleb Williams piece is going viral on the Facebook, 
I just will continue to say until draft time, I would pick Jaden Daniels over Caleb Williams. Of All right, Joe. I mean, come on. Uh, Ohio State hires Oregon running backs coach Carlos Lachlan. Your thoughts on the move for Ohio State? Yeah, I think it's a really underrated one. This is a guy that we didn't even bring up in the early conversation. The foregone thought was, oh, they're just going to go after one of the premier names. McCullough at Notre Dame was was one that we brought up. Uh, the Texas running backs coach is completely escaping my, my mind right now. But they, we assumed, we're going to go and spend money. This is one, I look at his background, having been a longtime high school offensive coordinator and then a director of high school relations at Memphis and Florida State. I think that this is a really nice piece to add to your coaching staff. Somebody who has direct relationships with head coaches across high schools across the country. I like this. I, I really do. I think it, it is against the grain of what we typically see sometimes with these hires where it's just go get the biggest name. You know, go go hire DeMarco Murray like Oklahoma did, who played for the team, and it's going to look really good in recruiting. But instead, let's get a guy who played at Chattanooga that's going to understand how to maintain and build relationships. I think that that is great for the running back position, and he's also worked with some pretty talented players in his couple of years at Oregon. I fully agree with you. You know, Joe, when this hire happened, you know what my first thought was? How much did Chip Kelly get involved in this? And let me tell you why. Because I think Chip Kelly had a front row seat to what Oregon was doing more than Ryan Day. Maybe not so much because Ryan, you know, Ohio State faced Oregon, you know, a while back, regardless. I do think that he had a lot of say into this, and I do think it's a fantastic hire. But he's going into a very loaded running back room. He's recruited well at Oregon. And the question is going to be how much can he get out of Henderson? How much can he get out of um, Quenchon Juckins? The Quenchon Juckins thing, regardless of whatever happens with Quenchon Juckins, is not going to be on him. My, my point would be with this, is, and something that I like Ryan Day, dudes that have called plays are all over the place. High recruiters, guys, people that have called plays. Joe, quite honestly, outside of Chip Kelly, they have a, 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 a staff that has been really good at recruiting. I think that Ryan Day, for the criticism, Joe, that he that he receives, some of it being a little unfair, Okay, mm -hmm. because if I put up Kirby's, you know, stats and, and what Kirby did versus Ryan Day and, and how similar they've been, both played for a national championship and lost. Okay, this would be the year that you would see Ryan Day ascend and, and win one. My own my only thing is, is that when it comes to staff additions, you got to give a tip of the cap to Ryan Day and what they're doing. I think this is a fantastic hire. I think. Going again, Carlos is in this position. I think that people thought that there was some stalemate at that position group and that there wasn't a good enough recruiting uh, there. I think that you changed that overnight. And, and Joe, good for them on not panicking. What do I mean by that? Being when patient. you're, yeah, they were very patient. They didn't freak out. They they didn't overreact. And I think that that goes to what Chip Kelly probably got in Ryan Day's ear about. And just Ryan Day having now more experience to not freak out and go and getting what I saw. Look, when this was made, I saw coaches around the country going, wow, like highly uh, surprised, not only surprised, but thought that this, this hire was highly thought of as one of the best in not just right now in, the, in a running back room, but one of the best position coaching hires that they could have made. Yeah, and again, I think that it is worth giving praise for this decision too because you're not – I almost think that it's it, it, it's not lazy, but it's, it's the easy thing to do to just go and spend all this money and use up a ton of your, your salary, your budget, your, your budget salary – salary budget, geez, and spending <laughs> it on a big premier name that could have been out there. But instead to well, look they for somebody – right. Right, they did it with Chip Kelly. For a position that sometimes doesn't always need to have the biggest name in the room to succeed, I think that it is creative for them to say, okay, let's look around the country. Let's look at opportunities and examples of guys that have found success but aren't typically brought up in the top conversations of the best at their position group. So I, I think that this is a really, really just strong fit for the way that they're building their coaching staff, that it really rounds things out. And it might put them in a much better position than what they had before. Lachlan is going to be a 
a hire that I think is going to pay dividends. Very much so. And again, I mean, look, I do think that there are some position groups like running back, you know, that get overlooked a lot and overshadowed, like you mentioned. He's got the bet. He's going to have to look. How do I want to say this? I don't want to put unwanted pressure, but he's going to have to deliver because there's nobody in the country that has a better running back room than you right now. Nobody. No. So no. if you're not having production and that, then that's on you, Bucko. I mean, you have, I mean, would Hender, Would you say that Henderson's a, a, a second round pick? Like, would you put him there? Yeah. 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 It's very hard okay, to so have a you first have round two running, back. running backs. They'll go in the top two rounds. Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, then you're to produce, and there's right. no other questions. You wanted to bring up Devin Brown. Do you want to get to that? No, I want to. I want to save that for. Okay, I want to save that for Wednesday because it's a bigger conversation. All right. How do you want to end it then? We'll be back on Wednesday. Okay. Well, I think it's a great hire. I think we had a good conversation, a good debate in the morning time here. I don't hate Oregon. I see the comments in there. I do not hate Oregon. Yeah. Well, yeah. Again, it's ironic because you picked. It's weird. We get to the offseason and everyone's memory just disappears where you've talked about Alabama and then everyone's like supporting my opinion of Alabama. And I know they it's forget so it was the other way around during the season. And then Oregon, it's, so it's the same thing where, you know, suddenly now I'm the supporter of Oregon, even though you know I hated so them crazy? during the season. Yeah. You know what's so crazy? I did not have any different of a take after Oregon lost to Washington both times than I did today. Zero. It just no. we're we're highlighting. Okay, you know maybe we put more of it on Dan Lanning. But if Dan's going to make those calls, you got to produce. You got to provide, right? Like you can't just. Joe, we're talking about two of the worst play calls in the, in the season. Like how, how we came out here and, and and talked about how dookie water of play calls there were. I'm not gonna. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. We'll we'll argue for the next thirty minutes if you really want to bring it bring it back up. A dookie water. All right, we'll see y'all again on Wednesday. Until then, y'all have a good one. Have a good day, Joe. Thanks. Thanks, Blake. You too. All right, peace.